All right, let's begin our reflection on the theme of the kingdom of God. So as we saw in chapter 1, verse 1, the kingdom of God is greater than any earthly kingdom, certainly greater than Rome, which would have been an astonishing claim to be making in the context of the time. Rome was the superpower. Rome controlled virtually any territory that anyone local to the Palestinian region would have been familiar with. And Mark is claiming straight out the gate that the kingdom of God is greater than that. But what does the kingdom consist of? For background, in terms of uh, the Jewish people, they had initially, as a community, been held together by familial relationships. That is, Abraham, the patriarch, received the promise from God that his children would be as numerous as the sands of the seashore and the stars of the sky and, and so forth. And then he had his son Isaac, and then Isaac had his son Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And each member of the Jewish nation, all of the Jewish people, would identify themselves as belonging to one of the families of those 12. Tribe of Judah, tribe of Benjamin, tribe of Levi, whomever, right? So the notion of the 12 patriarchs was the unifying concept of the Jewish people as a people. So now what does Jesus do? He appoints 12 apostles. That number 12 was an extremely strong statement. Just as proclaiming good news was a strong statement about the mission of Jesus relative to Rome, initiating 12 apostles was a statement that he was establishing a new covenant and a new covenant people with a new kind of relationship. The 12 apostles take the place of the 12 patriarchs. This is obviously a very radical teaching. He's come to bring about something very new with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God would not merely be a messianic expansion of the Jewish people. It would not merely be a reestablishment of the kingdom of David from a thousand years before. It was something very new and very different. Now, what's the primary entry into the kingdom? Baptism. As we saw in chapter 1, John's baptism was a sign of repentance for sins. But the baptism Jesus brings brings the Holy Spirit, the removal of sin, the cleansing of sin. And we have to remember that the Gospels, and Mark included all of them really, the Gospels emerged from the church. The church was prior to the Gospels. This is unimaginable to us today because, of course, we've had the Gospels for 20 centuries. But in the context of the time, the establishment of the church was fundamentally the Pentecost event. And knowing about Jesus came about through the oral teaching of the apostles. 
So Christians, the church, had been having the lived experience of the kingdom of God beginning with baptism prior to the writing of the gospel. Consequently, when Mark in his gospel reflects upon baptism, he knows that his audience will understand that reflection in the context of the Christian community in which they are already living. And so that's how his brief but pointed remarks about baptism relate back to the idea of the kingdom. Now, as I mentioned, this gospel was delivered to an audience of both Jewish and Gentile Christians, among whom there had maybe been some strife over adherence to the Jewish law. Sometimes, coming from our modern perspective, many of the disputes recorded in the Gospels about the Sabbath and diet and so forth might seem a bit arcane or irrelevant to us. Why? Because, of course, we've been living in a Christian community that's existed for many centuries now. But it certainly wasn't arcane to that audience at the time. He's doing two things. First of all, he is critiquing the habit of using or employing the law in a way that doesn't build people up spiritually. Consider, for instance, the man with the withered hand. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath, to save life? Looking around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart. The law shouldn't be an excuse for doing anything less <coughs> than what God is calling you to for the sake of the love of God and the love of your neighbor. In the tradition of the Catholic Church, in fact, doing a work of mercy on Sunday is considered an, a pious observance. In following the example Jesus set with the cure of the man with the withered hand. But in the context of the audience, this was not merely an abstract discussion. We know from Acts and from Paul's letters that there was pressure put on some Gentile Christians to adopt the fullness of the Jewish law, which included the unappetizing prospect of circumcision, for example. One of the interesting phenomena of Judaism at this time was that they had persuaded many Gentiles to worship their God without fully becoming Jewish because circumcision was unpopular for reasons. And those people actually became known as God-fearers. Christianity was extremely appealing to the God-fearers because it meant a way to fully worship God without undergoing circumcision. And that was part of the appeal. Mark then is emphasizing the Gentile Christians are not subject to the law. They do not need to be preoccupied about the law. They need to focus on discipleship. In the kingdom of God, these ceremonial aspects fall away, as we see with the man with the withered hand. Jesus relates a number of parables about the kingdom, which we'll examine next. In the parable of the lamp, says, is a lamp brought in to be placed under a bushel basket or under a bed and not to be placed on a lampstand. So if you've heard the good news, you want to be a light. You want to spread it. And obviously, this is a very challenging proposition which is partly why it's failed in a parable. 
What's this, why is this a challenging proposition? If you promote the good news of Jesus Christ, you are implicitly denigrating the supposed good news of Caesar. So to be a lamp, to shine like a lamp, that's a tremendous challenge. The measure with which you measure will be measured onto you, and still more will be given to you. To the one who has, more will be given. From the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Those of us that have been blessed to hear the gospel have a certain responsibility to bring the good news of the kingdom of God to others. The mustard seed. When it is sown in the ground, it is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. But once it is sown, it springs up and becomes the largest of plants and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the sky can dwell in its shade. So remembering that this is written in 49 AD, Christianity became legalized in 312 80, almost 300 years later. The parable of the mustard seed is an astonishing prophecy. Absolutely astonishing. Would it have been imaginable to the audience that Mark is addressing that the kingdom of God would become so manifest that it would in fact eventually become very much identified with the Roman Empire. That the Roman emperors would in fact make themselves subordinate to the church. Roman Emperor Theodosius, towards the end of the fourth century, at one point undertook a massacre of some people for some Roman reason and was thoroughly castigated for it by his bishop and he had to repent of it and he did that was the growth of the mustard seed unimaginable to the audience of the time. The kingdom of God dwells within the Catholic Church, is sheltered by the Catholic Church, nurtured by the Catholic Church, is by no means limited to it as such. Uh, God is so abundant in his grace that he even bestows it on people that have rejected his church. It happens. It's okay. Uh, we celebrate and appreciate the fact that millions of people appreciate and follow Jesus even if they're not part of his church, his visible church. But he certainly intended for the church to be a visible sign of the kingdom which is why following the Twelve Apostles is so important and why following their successors is so important. There's an interesting moment where he commissions them where he says, Simon, whom he named Peter, James and John, whom he named the Sons of Thunder. When God gives someone a new name, it commissions them with a special office. We saw that with Abraham, becoming Abraham, for example. Simon being called Peter is getting a new office. As we'll see as the gospel unfolds, Simon, James, and John are kind of an inner counsel for him. And he gives them new names to signify that. And Peter, in particular, is the leader and the spokesman, and this gets reflected all the way up to the end of the Gospel uh, in, in some very poignant scenes that we will encounter. That is, there is visible leadership of the church 
that houses the kingdom of God. And through the papacy, we follow that leadership to this day. And that would have been part, again, of what the audience understood. Unlike us, this was an audience that had actually met Peter. It's kind of interesting to think about. Some questions for reflection on the kingdom. How does Mark's explanation of the kingdom of God influence how you understand the role of the Catholic Church? What insights might you see about resolving doctrinal disputes from how Jesus addressed the issue of Sabbath observance? Contemplate any of the sayings in 421 to 34. What might Jesus be calling for you to do differently in your life? Take five minutes, examine one or more of these as the Spirit moves you. Then at 8.05, I'll start the third talk.